Deliberate Leaders. I am your host, Allison Dunn, executive coach and founder of the Deliberate Leaders podcast dedicated to helping leaders build strong, thriving businesses. Each episode, we feature inspiring interviews to help you on your leadership journey. And I'm super excited to introduce our guest today. We have with us Tim Spiker, and he is the founder of the Aperio um, and the Who Not What Principle. A profound research-based truth that helps um, that has helped power 15 years of leadership development success. Um, Tim's book, which is uh, the uh, the only leaders worth following, um, why some leaders succeed, others fail, and how the quality of our lives hangs in the balance, um, reveals 77 percent of leadership effectiveness comes from who leaders are, not what they do. Tim, thank you so much for joining us here on Deliberate Leaders. Happy to be with you. Looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. I always love to kick these off with a quick deliberate conversation. And um, I have to admit, your book is filled with wonderful um, tips. But what would be your number one leadership tip that you would want our audience to um, walk away with today? Well, you could call it a tip. It may run a little deeper than that, but it would be have the courage to look in the mirror. Have, I mean, it's hard. I don't think any of us want to do a self-analysis and find something other than, you know, glowing positives. But I find that the most effective leaders are willing to courageously look in the mirror, see some of those rough spots that they maybe weren't, you know, they wished weren't so rough. And sometimes, frankly, find stuff even worse than that. <laughs> Um, but a willingness to see that so that you can work on whatever it is, I think is perhaps the greatest, the greatest tip, if you want to call it that, that any leader could take on. Mm -hmm. I appreciate, I appreciate that tip. And I also feel like often, too often leaders are trying to put off on off this image that they're perfect in some way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I just, I love the sincerity of someone who's willing to um, say like, I'm just not good at this and I'm working on this. Um, so that's a beautiful, beautiful tip. Kerry um, Newhoff, another, another podcaster, he, he talks about the fact that followers admire leaders' accomplishments, but they relate to their failings. And so, you know, you just, you just find that people want to follow other human beings. And when we try to play that game, and maybe it's even out of well intention. Maybe it's not about ego, but we want people to feel good about who they're following. Uh, if we never have any flaws, it's hard for people to see us as human beings and they really do want to follow other human beings. So I, I love the way that Carrie puts that. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, um, you consistently use, it's on the, on the footer of all of your pages, <laughs> three quarters of your effectiveness as a leader comes from who you are and not what you do. And um, the book talks a lot about that, but I'd love for you to um, kind of highlight um, what that means to you. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it sounds, when you say three quarters of your effectiveness as a leader comes from who you are, not what you do. It sounds a little like, you know, somebody sat at a table one day and said, well, I bet it's about this. Um, but your, your opening line is actually, you know, you let in 77% is the actual number. We just round it to three quarters and now it starts to sound like research, which is, which is in fact what it is. Okay. So um, I was working for a boutique consulting firm. We had people up to the uh, west side of Pikes Peak for a week at a time. So uh, heading towards those beautiful Rocky Mountains that you are a part of. Yep. And we did a series of assessments and people would ask us, what's the magic mix? Is there a magic personality style plus natural abilities? that leads to a more effective leader. And we had the data to run it. So my colleague, Vanessa Kiley, she put her expertise to, to, to work with the SPSS software. And here's what we found. Nothing. We found no correlations <laughs> in it, between personality, natural ability, and leadership performance. But as I turned to leave her office that night, she said, but we did find something elsewhere that we weren't looking for. And so I kind of turned back in and What'd you find? She said, well, we have eight aspects of leadership that we're measuring and just two of them are driving almost 70% of the variability on the assessment. And if you think about a pizza, any two pieces split it into eight pieces, only two should only be worth 25%. Right. 
Years later, as, a, as the uh, data multiplied by 10, she ran the analysis again, and that number went from just under 70% to 77%. So it was verified even more with more data points. And so years later, as because sometimes, I mean, sometimes stuff's right in front of us, but we can't see it <laughs> until later on. But it was literally three years later when I kind of stepped back and said, what were these two areas that were driving the results, 77% of the results, two out of eight, it's just really out of whack. They're not all equal. And, and the light bulb came on one day that those two areas were about who the leader is as a person. The other six were about what a leader does. And that's where the who not what principle was born, that three quarters is driven by who. Awesome. So um, I just, I love the, the two qualities that you've highlighted that are so critical. So can you, can you share what the two qualities are? Sure. So what were those two? It was inwardly sound and others focused. Mm -hmm. So you know, we think about the concept of inwardly sound. We can go through a, a laundry list of things that make that up. And there are some key elements there. But if you just take that idea, I think just at the surface level, you know, what does it mean to be sound? Like think of a boat. What does it mean to have a vessel that is sound? It's trustworthy. It's not going to break apart with a few bumps. Um, you, can, you can put your security and your safety in it. Now just think about those same terms and put in a leader's name. This is somebody who's safe to be around. They don't get thrown off by a few bumps. They have integrity to them like the hull of a ship would. So we think about being inwardly sound. It's somebody who's really rock solid internally, doesn't easily get thrown off and creates some of that psychological safety that people have been talking quite a bit about over the last number of years. That's inwardly sound. Uh, others focus is is you know perhaps as blatant at its at, it, at its title. It means that as a leader, uh, this whole thing isn't about me. Uh, I might be uh, I might be the person who's responsible for our outcomes, but this is very much about the team. This is very much about, in fact, not even just with me. It's about others. I'm showing up for the sake of the people that I'm leading and not just the enterprise, but literally for those people. I am an others focused person. And that, that comes with all of the, the low ego, the attentiveness, the empathy, all of those types of things come in to make an others focused leader. And so those are the two big categories, inwardly sound and others focused. When people show up well-developed, when leaders are inwardly sound and others focused, that takes our trust in them through the roof and that ultimately drives performance and results. Fantastic. Um, in, um, in your book, you talk about how one has to almost proceed before the other one can take place. So can you talk about um, that from the trust, trust element you just spoke about? Yeah, so, so if we think about kind of building up, um, we wanna be able to give out of a reservoir. And sometimes we haven't built our own reservoir in order. It's almost that, that classic story about put your own oxygen mask on first. And so ultimately being inwardly sound really is the foundation through which leaders are going to be able to be others focused. Um, I've been around some leaders who really latched onto the idea of being others focused, but hadn't done their own work to be inwardly sound yet. And it all goes sideways. Um, and it becomes, I'm trying to, care for and serve others who I'm leading, but I'm showing up as a really insecure leader. And so it, what's ultimately happening is I'm dealing with those, the team is dealing with my insecurity, even as I'm trying to be an others focused leader and it gets, it gets sideways pretty quickly. So you wanna foundationally build off of inwardly sound into being others focused. In, um, in, any, well, in your experience, those that you've kind of shared stories from and um, those that you've trained, how, what are some of the, the things that someone who might feel like they need to look in the mirror and, and work on the inwardly, um, it, the inward part, what are some of the things that people should consider doing? Well, gosh, let's see. There's a few different places to start okay. there. Um, for a moment, we'll talk about some stuff, and this is not going to be rocket science, but it's a part of the equation. One of the things we talk about in terms of being inwardly sound is what does it mean to be holistically healthy? That is, is I, if I were to break my life into eight different parts, physical, financial, intellectual, vocational, emotional, relational, mental, and spiritual, and say, where's my level of health? 
almost think about it as eight gas gauges and where's my energy level. We need to be investing, whether you want to call it in habits, practices, rituals, disciplines, there's a lot of different words for it. But what are those things that are regularly a part of our, of our weeks and our days that help bring energy into those areas? What are those things that create health and margin? It's really important that we care for those different areas because ultimately that's what gives leaders resilience and capacity. And there isn't a leader on the planet that doesn't need resilience and capacity because the challenges are gonna come and so will the opportunities. And so that's an example of one area that people end up doing a lot of work in around helping them take steps toward being a more inwardly sound. Okay, awesome. Um, I appreciate that we, um, we do kind of an assessment each year and I don't even know who originally created like the wheel of life concept, like, you know, the circle when you kind of look at all the different um, pieces of the pie or the hubs on the scope, yeah. but um, that's a really cool exercise. So if any, anyone who's listening hasn't done that, I've got, um, it's probably copyrighted somewhere, but I have a, <laughs> of that. and I think, I think it from the proper sources. <laughs> it came from an amazing yeah. source who I would love to give credit. Yeah. I don't know who it was. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, can you just dive a little bit deeper into the who, not what principle? Um, yeah. And um, how should people think about that? Your stories really resonate with me um, in the book, and maybe maybe that's a good way to do it. But um, you know, can you dive into that a little bit further? Sure, sure. Um, oh gosh, which story to pick from? Uh, so many to pick from. You know, I'll 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 pick a story that a lot of people like from the book, and it's about my former basketball basketball coach, a guy named Gene Cady. Now, uh, I, my first two years in college, I played basketball at Purdue University, and Gene Cady is a Hall of Fame coach, and kind of, he is in many ways like the epitome of Purdue basketball. And he's seen from the external, he's this very rough and gruff guy. <laughs> and he is definitely one of the most competitive um, people I've ever been around in my life. But there's something very interesting about playing for Coach Cady is there just was a deep care for the person for the individual, not necessarily the athlete, but the person. And you get a sense for that he was there, he was there for you. He wasn't there for his ego. He wasn't there for his bank account, but he, he was there for you. And so, you know, one example of that is every day in practice, we would have had, we would have an emphasis of the day. And once in a while, it would be about basketball. But most of the time it was about life. And you, so you just saw somebody who was investing you, investing in you as a human being. And you got a sense that you had value that went beyond your ability to put a leather ball in a hoop. And so that made an impression over time. And so one of the things that Purdue basketball is known for is how hard we played. In fact, on the back of everybody's practice shorts was play hard. And that's kind of, you know, famously a Purdue basketball thing. And he was, was able, it wasn't just that coach expected that of us. Uh, I would say as a group, we wanted to give that because here was a person that was not, back to that other's focus idea, he wasn't showing up just for the sake of his own, his own ego and his own, you know, what he could get out of. It. And so that caused us to trust more. That caused us to, you know, really, really reach into that, that, uh, that want to instead of just giving the have to. We want to, you know, it's that extra mile that you talk about. You want that discretionary effort that anybody's able to give. And in the long run, for 25 years, Gene Cady was, a, a, I believe, National Coach of the Year seven times. I mean, we had a tremendous amount of success while he was at Purdue. But one of the very interesting notes over, the time, over time is that Purdue wasn't always seen as the most athletically gifted team. It wasn't necessarily the team with the best players, but it routinely – finished higher in the standings than it was predicted to. And one of those reasons is because of that kind of play hard mentality that was fueled by somebody that wasn't there for his own self. And you just saw, you know, maybe a lot of people from a media standpoint didn't get to see it, but, but I got to see a real human being. And uh, the story that caps this off is when I left Purdue, a few years later, I started, got a letter in the mail one day Purdue had won three Big Ten championships in a row right after I left. And I'm, I'm hoping there's no correlation between those two things, but that was the time. <laughs> and it was a letter from the assistant coach, Bruce Weber. And he said, 
the recent success of the basketball program has been uh, rooted in the people who have invested in the program in the past. And so Coach Katie, in his latest contract with Nike, required that once a year, Nike was going to be sending a piece of Purdue basketball gear, you know, a sweatshirt, a hoodie, a nice polo shirt, whatever, once a year, send it out to all the former players. You know, most of us had nothing to be able to give back to Purdue at that point. Um, it was, hey, they're, you know, we, we, they had no reason to necessarily invest in us or care about or include us in what was going on. Yet that's how Coach saw it, even to the point where he negotiated that type of thing into his contract. And I think that it's a small gesture, but, but he thought about that. He thought about past players and said, and, and by the way, the, the kicker part of this story, I was a non-scholarship walk-on who played in 27 minutes over two years. In other words, I never got to play. I, I, and I even transferred to finish school elsewhere and I was still included. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor about who Gene Cady was and why he was able to outperform predictions for 25 years. Um, thank you for sharing that story. That's, um, I think coaches have such a huge impact on our world sports and, and all, all different types of coaches. Mm -hmm. But you draw a really great correlation, which you, um, you talk about in the book and your research about results of, um, of different types of leaders. So can you, um, can you um, just share those statistics um, yes. you have? Um, well, Let's let's back up one second. Which there's a lot of statistics, so let me yeah. let me make sure I'm hitting it on the head for what no, you're. No, that's okay. So um, when when um, leaders have those two top qualities, the types of results that they get from their teams, where they don't necessarily have to be the you know number one in their industry or the top notch, but that they've created a team that gets results. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So. Um, Let's, let's build what we're going to call the arc of leadership here. Like we're going to build yeah. the, the why. This is one of the things. The research showed that who not what existed as a principle, but it didn't explain why. So let me, I'll quickly explain why, and then we'll kind of look at some of the statistics there. So we talked about these two ideas, inwardly sound and others focused. When leaders show up with those two things, we trust them more. And there's nothing really complicated about that. When somebody is not crazy, to put it in, <laughs> in different terms, or as one person I did an interview with said, so you're saying they're not a dumpster fire as a person. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's one way to look at it. So when somebody is inwardly sound, they bring that sense, that sense of stability. We trust them more. When they're others focused, we don't question their motives as much um, and more should we because they're about others. That increases trust. When trust goes up, and this is the thing that's not talked about enough, I don't think. When trust goes up, engagement goes up. When trust goes up, engagement goes up. And there's over 300 studies worldwide that show the connection between engagement and performance. And so that's the connection point. When we become more trustworthy by becoming inwardly sound and others focused, we get greater engagement from the people that we're leading and that greater engagement produces a better result. So you started with, you were asking about statistics. I'm gonna, there's, there's a few different places to go, but I want to reference uh, KRW is a, a consulting firm based out of Minneapolis uh, here in the United States. And they had a study, a study published in HBR uh, a number of years ago. And they were rating, they were rating executive teams on a number of qualities around who, which doesn't happen very often. So that research study definitely got my attention. And so they took the top 10 executives and executive teams as rated on, on who based qualities. And then they took the bottom 10 and they compared them. And those that rated in the top 10 had a return on assets during the course of the study that was 4.8 times as great as those in the bottom 10. So you're talking about a bottom line result with the connection to those who based qualities. And, and KRW is a good organization, which is to say they don't attribute everything to leadership. They understand that there's cycles in markets and industries and so, they're, they're smart enough to not say, not all variability is about leadership. They, they pair it back to say, what's the portion that's just attributable to those qualities? And so, so that's, that got, that's a one example of data that shows up from the Harvard Business, Business Review through KRW. Okay. Um, when, when, you, um, when you speak on this, what are the biggest objections that you hear around the principle itself? 
Well, I'm sure this is going to invite an email from somebody, but that's fine. That's great. I don't run into a lot of objections about the principle. Uh, because here, here's the question that we love to ask, and, and I ask this over and over again. And um, feel free to take this as far as you like. But, but the question is, who's the, who's the best leader you've ever personally followed? And when I ask people that question, the room gets pretty loud pretty quickly. Like pair up with a partner and talk about that person. And then I'll, I'll pull some people out of the audience and say, tell me a little bit about the person that you selected. And it's just fascinating to listen to what people talk about because they don't talk about skills. They don't even talk about quarterly profit. I've never had, I've never pulled somebody up on stage and said, so tell me about the best leader you've ever followed. Nobody starts off by, let me tell you how great she was at Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Project or, or anything related to business or planning or strategy. They talk about who, who the person is as an individual. And they really dig into that as the source of what got the, uh, what got the very best out of them. So that's that's an example of you know of ultimately when you when you start to bring it close to home people begin to see that it's not only true in the research but it's been true in their own lives and so there aren't a lot of objections to the concept now the number one question maybe we could switch it over that what's the question i don't get a lot of objections but here's the question the question is can people who are not spring chickens actually grow and develop in who they are or is this just a, you know, is this just a losing battle ultimately because like uh, the TBU, true but useless. Fine, Tim, this is true, but I can't do anything about it because isn't it true that I'm ultimately settled in who I am by the age of 30? And I think, I think we get to that conclusion um, or that idea pretty honestly. It's just that it's not true. So... Um, the question is, can people grow and develop at the core of who they are? Research by uh, Cheryl Armand and Theo Dawson has proven that over a longitudinal study, 14 years. In fact, they found the people who reach the pinnacle of moral development never reach it before the age of 35. And in their study, they had people making progression who started the study when they were at the age of 55. And so there is research data that show that we can grow and develop later on in life. I just think it's harder. It's tougher. We are a little more baked. So it's not that it's easy. It's tougher. And so ultimately, it's not a, it's not a question of can or can't. It is a question of will or won't. And we have seen older leaders who are unwilling to do the hard work of continuing to grow in who they are later on. And we understandably but erroneously conclude that you can't grow and develop later on in life. And it's, and it's simply not true. I'll share one anecdote to back this up. So there's research to show it. One of my favorite stories with a client that we had the privilege of working with. We're about, we tend to do longer term development because this is harder work. And we were 18 months into the engagement. And a senior executive of a, of a multinational said, I got to tell you this story, Tim, and, and, and credit to him because he did the work. He worked hard on what we were doing about who he was. He said, I just had one of my folks come to me and say, 18 months ago, I was leaving this organization and you were the reason. Now I'm staying and you are the reason. That's 18 months of really digging in and being willing to do that hard work, that courage to look in the mirror that we talked about at the beginning. So anecdotally, I have seen it. Um, I've seen it across organizations where we worked with leaders who were almost exclusively in the age range of 40 and 50 and 60. And we watched their organizational health index number from McKinsey. We watched it go up by 21% over the course of five years. Not all because of the work in who not what, but, but that, that played a, a big contributing factor. And again, I'll go back to credit to the people who are willing. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I can talk all day long about stats and data and research, and I can give people exercises and practices. If they're not willing, guess what happens? Absolutely nothing. So credit to the people who are willing to do the hard work, but it is possible if you're willing. 
Um, I love that. I feel like um, I'm on a mission to, uh, you know, uh, be the very best person I can possibly be. And it is, it's an, it's a constant journey, right? Um, yes. Sure. Yes. And I promise it, I'm, all of it, almost all of it happened after I was 30, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is, and, and still it goes, right? It's, it's yep. never ending. Yes. Yep. Never ending. Um, I um, I know that in at least in um, some of the circles that I work in as an executive coach that um, I have individuals who I at least from all of the um, interaction that I've had they appear to be very inwardly sound and struggle to be others focused and so they've got the right um, a mix of what's needed. What is the, some of the techniques or perceptions that um, a coach might help someone else to amplify their other's focused lens and be less self-centered? Okay, great. And I love the frankness with which you say that. Like, let's not beat around the bush here. Now let's dance around the issue. It has to do is I'm going to be a self-absorbed person or not. Am I going to be a person who's selfish or not? And so... These are things that for some reason we're relatively uncomfortable talking about in the marketplace, but we have to, yeah. we have to. Organizations are made up of people. <laughs> These are the people problems, myself included. I could bring in witnesses. So, you know, it's not like because I talk about this that I somehow haven't mastered. Totally um, get it. Yeah. So th there's two things. One is a big overarching question that I like to share with people and just let it sit. And another one is a bit more of a here, let's do this, do this, do this repeatedly. So the big arc overarching question is to what extent are people worthy of my focus? Mm -hmm. To what extent are others worthy of my focus? It's essentially a worldview question. Right. Because if I show up at work every day thinking, you know, this is basically about me. I'm awesome. Other people are trying to catch up to that fact. Hopefully someday they'll figure it out. There's a pretty low chance that I'm going to interact with others as if they're worth my time and energy. And I can become a leader through which, hey, every, and here's the thing, is people who are following leaders in any position, they're generally going to play into this story because they want to do well, they want to advance, they want to help create success. And so you really have to work hard against being self-centered as a leader because the followers around you will largely participate. <laughs> They'll say, yes, in fact, the world does revolve around you leader, so let's get going. Now, they may not be feeling awesome about it on the inside, but they want to remain employed and they, they, they want to do well. And so they can participate. So you really have to work hard. And that question, to what extent are others worth my focus is a place to start as a big, broad question. And for us to, again, try to be really honest with ourselves, is that a little tiny portion of people or is it a bigger portion uh, that I could be more excited about? So challenging yourself with that question is one thing. Uh, the other thing, did you, I'll pause there. Anything you wanted to, to follow up on that before we get to the practice? I honestly, I feel like that's a really powerful question. Um, and, um, and it's almost striking of like, I almost have to go, well, what do you mean? Um, and yet, I don't, I don't think I've ever looked at anything that way, like you are not worthy or you are worthy, but that's a, that's a really powerful question. Well, here's one way to think about it. Are people who can't give me anything in return, are they worth my time? I mean, yeah. it's like the true test. Yeah. If I can't receive something from you, are you still worth my energy? Are you still worth my attention? That's probably a, a really good litmus test to start. For sure. Out. For sure. Because, you know, maybe I give my time to all the superstars or the up and comers, I'm investing in them. Well, what about the people that don't show up with maybe quite that same that same set of talent. Um, they're, maybe you say, well, they're never going to run anything around here. And so they're not worth it. I, I, I literally have heard people say like, you know, that team, they're useless to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really a commentary on what's your view on, on humans at a certain level. I mean, I know that sounds really esoteric and big, but we have worldviews and they help drive our behavior. So that's kind of a secondary question to say, you know, you know, 
would I be willing to invest time and energy in somebody that I couldn't just get an immediate return from? So, um, on the on the more like, okay, so how does that show up in behavior? How does that show up in action? One of the things we talk about in terms of being an others focused leader is being curious, being curious and not just curious about facts. There are a hundred articles out there about intellectual curiosity and that's important, not against intellectual curiosity. But if we don't add curiosity about other people, about their ideas, about their emotions, about their perspectives, then we are losing an enormous part of what is the curious equation. And so ultimately, when we begin to operate as leaders who are curious, we're looking at the whole of the story, not just the facts, ma'am. You know, we're not, we're not doing that thing. We're saying, no, not just the facts. The facts plus the rest of the story, to, to quote Paul Harvey from, from, from days long ago. And so one of the ways that we work with leaders around that is very, very simple. I mean, again, some of this is not complicated at all, but it's just saying, hey, in the next 90 days, I'd like to challenge you to use the following phrase a hundred times. And that phrase is, tell me more about that. Now that phrase was taught to me by Dr. Mary Shippey. So shout out to Dr. Mary Shippey. She, she actually was working with me personally on who I am when she taught me that phrase. And it changed my life absolutely changed my life. I began to see how judgmental I was of other people. I began to see how sure I was of things that, Tim, you really can't be sure about that because you don't actually know. And as I began to use that phrase, um, Ali, I would say 95 to maybe 98% of the time when I say to somebody, tell me more about that. I hear at least a nugget of something that was not what I expected. A little bit more, I mean, it's not usually 180 degrees off, but it's five degrees more information, either about them or the situation. And you really build into this habit of being curious. Um, it really starts to get a hold of you. And it can be like, almost like you're opening a Christmas present every time you ask the question, because what am I going to hear? that I wouldn't have expected, or that might be just a little bit different than what I expected. So simply using a phrase like, tell me more about that on a regular basis does two things. It brings us more information, which leaders are always looking for more information to make better decisions, but it also builds better relationships. When people begin to see us genuinely taking an interest in them, and it has to be genuine, it can't be fake, but when they begin to see that, we're now opening the door to the flow of information much wider than it was before. And if we make that about who, and if that becomes, hey, that's a part of who I am. It's not just me on, I just you know, threw it in here on a Tuesday, but every day it becomes who I am. Those doors of information and relationship get wider and wider open and we get a chance to become better leaders because of that. That's awesome. Um, as a coaching practice, it's one of my favorite questions to ask. It really is. So it's super powerful. Yeah. Great. In, um, so we're in a very unique time um, in our world right now. And um, for, for people who maybe are leading through this time and leading in a totally different way than they have, you know, all in office spaces. And so we're more um, separate. What are some of the, um, what would be a few things that you would want to impart on anyone who might be struggling with their own leadership, um, either their leader that they're looking up to or the leader that they're trying to bring out in themselves right now during this time? So are, let me, can I ask a clarifying question? <laughs> Are we speaking specifically about kind of the remote leadership reality that so many people are in right now regarding COVID? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I think the connection between people is never going to be unimportant when it comes to leadership. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing something remotely like we are today or whether you're in the same room, the connection is important. And it's a lot more natural when you think about um, when you think about showing up for a meeting. Well, let's go. Let's let's go all the way back nine months into this totally different world than we're than we're in now. 
Right. And, you know, you'd show up to the meeting five minutes early and people would be filtering in the room mm -hmm. and the person happens to be there next to you and like, hey, how you been? Like there's a little bit of personal interaction. And that rarely happens with Zoom. That rarely happens on WebEx. That rarely happens in these electronic interactions. And so I've talked with some leaders that during this time who have been intentionally setting aside time for interaction that's not about the business. Because we don't have those natural, we're not bumping into each other in, at the water cooler, literally. That's, right. that's not happening now. And so some leaders are saying, hey, can I schedule a meeting with you? And I just want to catch up. No, I don't want to talk about work. I want to say, how are you doing? How's your family doing? Um, let's invest a little time because we get to do this naturally when we're in the office together, but we're not in the office together right now. And so there's some ways I think that leaders from a relational standpoint, in order to be connected with their people, they, they might have to do some things that almost feel awkward. Like this is like forced relationship, but, you, but we have to, I actually haven't heard any reports of people saying, oh, please don't ask me how I am. Please stop um, caring about me. Please don't do whatever you do. Like stop checking in about my family. I just don't let you know. I don't want people to care about how this is affecting us. I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing the opposite. I'm hearing some great connections. So it brings up another thing is that sometimes as leaders, we have to be willing to do some things that might feel a little bit awkward. We have to be willing to do something. We can't be so concerned about being prim and proper, or we can't be so concerned about, well, how will they think of me? Um, we have to be willing to put ourselves out there. Take that risk. Go first. Initiate. That's your job as a leader, is for you to take that risk and create a space for the people that you're leading. So I would say in these, in these remote times, it probably requires a more intentional effort on our part to stay relationally connected with the people that we're leading. Yes. Excellent, excellent advice. Um, Tim, I, um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I, I definitely don't want to wrap it up without asking, is there something I didn't think to ask you or bring up that you were hoping to touch on today? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, gosh, you, you, you do such a good job kind of opening these big wide doors. So, no, I, I mean, I don't know if I've ever said no to that question before, Ali. So congratulations. You <laughs> might be yes, the very first. But um, no, I can't think of anything specific. We got a chance to, to touch on a lot of those uh, big bucket issues. So thank you. Absolutely. I, um, I just, um, I want to uh, compliment you. I mean, I do a lot of reading and this was a really fun book to read with the balance of research and stories and um, concepts. So thank you very much for that. I encourage uh, listeners to pick up their copy. Um, which I will include too in our show notes. What is the best way for people to um, follow what you are doing? Okay. Um, best way to, to, to connect with us is at the, T-H-E, onlyleaders.com. If you get there, you'll have a chance. We're actually working on a discussion for the guide uh, for the book uh, there. So if you're interested in that, you could sign up and and uh, probably uh, get something free whenever that becomes available. And you can also uh, check out there. Uh, we do something called Journeys, where we take people on an extended investigation into who they are over a period of time so they can really unpack inwardly sound and others focus for themselves. And if you uh, check out our website there, you'll get a chance to learn a little bit about what Journeys look like as well. Awesome. Tim, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, I look forward to seeing what you're up to next. Allie, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. Thank you.